The Databases for Machine Learning and Machine Learning for Databases seminar series at Carnegie Mellon University is recorded in front of a live studio audience. Funding for this program is made possible by Google and from contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. All right, guys, let's get started. Uh, we're excited today to have Montana Lowe, who's the co-founder and is CEO or CTO, I forget. CEO. CEO. Oh, that sucks. Uh, <laughs> it does. Yeah, I, I'm in the same boat, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's the CEO and co-founder of PostgreSQL. It's a uh, host of Postgres uh, instances that also have deeply integrated with uh, ML frameworks, and he's here to talk about what the stuff they've been doing. Um, and again, as always, if you have questions for Montana as he's giving his talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and fire your question, Adam. And feel free to do this at any time. And that way he's not talking himself at you know on Zoom for an hour by, you know, which can get lonely. So Montana, we appreciate you being here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Andy. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, as, as Andy said, feel free to interrupt me. It'll it'll probably improve the coherence of my my words coming out of my mouth. Uh, but we'll we'll dive right in. Um I like to start with a recap of the whole talk, a summary, so that you know what like what we're actually gonna talk about. Um Zoolander is one of my favorite movies, but the reason the reason you should care about PostgreSQL and the way that we do things and the way that we use databases, um, I think Andy was mentioning this a little bit before the talk, is we're not uh, we don't deeply change the internals of Postgres uh, by you know using columnar storage or, or doing distributed compute or things like that. Most of our usage of Postgres is much more similar to application usage of Postgres but we move a lot of the important machine learning things into the database. And the reason we do this is because it gives us more efficiency, more reliability and scalability in the database. And when you look at, compare it to a lot of the point solutions that you'll that um, PostgreSQL is competitive with in the ML landscape, it's a lot more capable because it's built on top of the entire Postgres ecosystem and foundation. Um, obviously, Postgres is one of the most compatible pieces of software. Every language in the world has bindings for it and can call into it. So you don't have to worry about like, is there a client or or whatever. And when we, one of the big components of Postgres ML is that it's part of the open source ecosystem and not just the Postgres is open source database, our extension is open source, but all of the models that we serve um, and there's lots of publicly accessible models and algorithm implementations. It's all open source end to end. So that means, you know, as a as an end user, you have a lot more control over how the system is going to work. Um, it's also a very opinionated system. There's there's a lot of like any application. There's 101 ways to skin a cat. Uh, but Postgres ML, we've we've made decisions that work well together to give you a, a complete platform. Um, rather than having individual touch points like, yes, sure, Pinecone is an excellent vector database, but I hope that you have bindings in your language for it. Um, otherwise, it might not work very well, like if you're trying to ETL data from your data warehouse, for example. Um, and finally, you know, this, this project is really just fun for me and a bunch of the other people that work on it. It's, you know, we're, we're, fairly small project at this point, and we have fairly new technology so that you know, we don't have all the technical debt of some of the machine learning systems that I've worked on in the past, um, and you know, we'll enjoy it while it lasts. So I'll dive right into some of the motivations for why we actually started thinking that it was a good idea to move some of these machine learning workloads deep into the database, um, because uh, I mean, I'm sure Andy has had too many times in his life where somebody's added something to his one of the databases he's responsible for. It's an obscene workload that should never that just takes the whole thing down. Um, and this is a very common refrain. And so a lot of DBAs um, and for all of you who are taking a databases course, you know, you'll need to protect the database from unwarranted abuse. And this happens all of the time. Um, but one very classical use case for a database in the world is the common web application architecture. You know, you've got your software application up top and you've got your database. Uh, and, and then of course it's connected to the internet. And there's, there's a couple important things here is that apps are stateless uh, and the databases are responsible for maintaining all of the state in the system and persisting that long-term. But, and because these things are connected to the internet, uh, there's latency inherent in the system. 
And so any of the latency introduced by separating the state and the statelessness is you know, very small compared to the latency inherent in crossing the continent of the world over a network connection. Um, and so when you when you look at like actually, you know, th this is this is great for your first whatever prototype MVP. Um, everybody should start with something very simple, like as a very simple architecture. I would discourage anybody from getting overly complicated with their database or their application technology choices. Um, it's it's much more important to get something working quickly. Um, but when you talk about the scaling of a system like this, you often think like, okay, if as soon as we get more users, what we really will do is we'll scale the app because scaling stateful processes is hard. But what inev inevitably happens if you're successful is that your app keeps scaling. And every time you add more application workload, that does increase your database workload. And eventually you reach a point where your database is starting to get a little bit hot. And so you start looking at ways like, how can we remove database workload? Um, quick, quick, easy ways to do that are let's cache more stuff in the app. Um, and so your, your app starts to become st stateful over time as you pull database workloads out of the database and it gets more and more complicated. And hopefully your application is, or your business is very successful and you have this problem. It's a great problem to have. Um, but eventually the amount of state that you'll be ma managing in your app will continue to grow. But at the same time, you're still going to be adding more and more load to your database until the point where you finally cave and you, you actually start Googling on like, how do I actually scale a database? And you'll realize that, oh, it's actually pretty easy with Postgres. You just stand up a replica. Um, and mo there are so many workloads in the world uh, that can be handled by read-only non-transactional queries that are executed you know, outside of the normal scope of things. And so it's perfectly fine for those queries to go to a replica. And they can be dealing with data that's one, two, maybe seconds, maybe days stale. Um, and so you, a lot of systems can be scaled pretty far this way. Um, just to give you some examples, I think Instacart was doing hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue before we got to the point of needing a replica. Um, I think Figma um, and Spotify are similar stories where you, they scaled these massive, massive businesses um, on a single database, basically. And then they're like, oh, what do we do next? And, oh, okay, <laughs> a replica, that's easy. But eventually, you know, Instacart went through the pandemic and they became a household name. And that meant more and more app servers were required. And you know the dreaded day came when we had to shard databases. And when you have to shard databases, it gets pretty messy. You have like the application has to decide what goes where. Um, if any of these databases fails, which happens more and more frequently, you have to have failover logic. You're now managing a whole fleet of databases. Um, and and it's like, how do you how do you operationalize database management? It's not quite as simple as like, oh, we'll just spin up Kubernetes and we'll, we'll Dockerize this stuff. Um, there, there are more considerations that you have to make when you're dealing with stateful systems. And so in the end, you end up with a lot more database if you're successful. Um, and so this this architecture, you know, there's there was a huge backlash in the industry in the maybe aughts in the web 2.0 days, and everyone was like, hey, let's move to microservices. And the, the, you know, one one way of thinking about or defining microservices is that you're trying to design a service that will never require that second database. Um, you know, replication is old, but it's not that old um, in terms of functionality that's always been easily available to people. Um, and so there, there's this idea that like, oh, we'll have, we'll just have services and we'll just keep breaking up the application into smaller and smaller services. And anytime our database gets too big, we'll just break that database apart. Um, but this, this actually gets pretty slow um, because you get more and more network latency. And eventually what happens is in a, in a clean service oriented architecture, an entire web request can be serviced by a single service. Um, and so like one easy example here is like, maybe you have a metrics service and all of your user metrics that you're collecting from the client side data, all it is is a single post request and it just records some JSON about some event that happened somewhere. Um, and that can be, that can go into one database table, that's your events table. That can be a standalone database. It's very small, it's very self-contained. But eventually you get cross-cutting concerns. 
Uh, one example of these cross-cutting concerns is like the search system at Instacart. And so when you think about like product search, you type something into a form field, it goes off and then you get a bunch of products displayed back to you. But the, the logic that occurs there involves multiple machine learning models. It involves half a dozen microservices. Uh, you know, I think it's closer to a dozen actually um, at the worst point. Many of these have circular dependencies uh, and they have their own statefulness and they become like these big app level things actually that start to have all the same problems that we had with our monolithic architecture. And, and then you eventually have to figure out how you're going to shard or scale that, that final database. Um, one of, <laughs> one of the great things about microservice architectures, that's also a terrible thing is that, you know, this frees up every team to choose their own database to be suited exactly to the, the purpose that they need. And so at Instacart, you know, we were running Postgres, but also Redis, Memcache, Cassandra, Druid, Redshift, Snowflake. Um, I'm forgetting several of them, but I think if there was a major database that was popular in the last 10 years, we were probably running it behind some microservice. Most of these, many of these were for machine learning models as feature stores or model stores. I mean, you can call S3 a database if you want. Um, it, it's very important. Uh, oh, SQLite, of course, SQLite in S3, uh, because why not? Um, it, That's the it, outer circle of hell, right? That's like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to you have to realize, like, yeah, your your descent into hell is like one level at a time, and you're just like, okay, I've got to get out of this circle. Where do I go next? The only way, I guess, is down. Um, it's like. Right. Yeah. At least you didn't say the big O word, right? <laughs> Which, oh, oh, yeah. Thank, thank God. Uh, but no, we, we had people who were like, "Why don't we use MySQL?" Because you know, Postgres is, um, has vacuuming, and I don't like that. And I'd rather ha anyway. Uh, you you can once you open the can of worms that is microservices, it's it's pretty hard to put it back in the box. But eventually, we did um, to a large degree. Uh, at Instacart, um, my, my, the way I think about you know microservices is that like you, you thought it was hard to manage a sharded database system, but it was a single kind of database. It is much, much more difficult to reason about what happens when, for example, your memcache cluster goes down um, and now your database or your service that was depending on that is now backfilling memcache. And how is it doing that? Of course, it's hitting your primary application database, which then takes your primary application database down, uh, which then brings down the whole site. But you thought you had microservices with database you know, isolation. And it's, it's really, really difficult to actually achieve that level of isolation when things get complicated. Um, so to give you an idea of how complicated things can get, you know, this is this is a chart created originally by Andreessen Horowitz, who's one of the big vest investors here in the Valley. Um, for example, they they invested $100 million in Pinecone recently, which is one of the hot new vector databases. They are very in touch with what companies are doing. And I've included a link in this graph to their original write-up and blog post where they presented this. This is only a small, you know, expanded box in their much larger data infrastructure diagram, um, but it gives you a peek into what you need to actually build a machine learning model and a machine learning service. And like when a request for search comes in and it's using a dozen models created by a dozen different data scientists, you'll notice that in each one of these boxes, there's always a handful of different competitive technologies that can be used for that function. Inevitably, your data scientists will all make different choices, just like they did for their databases. And if you don't have a really strong machine learning platform that's that's sort of solved all of these problems, uh, you'll every single request will go through a different microservice that's virtually an entirely new and different stack. Um, each one of those requests will take anywhere from fifty to five hundred milliseconds. If you have a search system that you know first has to do named entity rec recognition, and then it has to do synonym detection, and then it has to do query expansion, and then it has to do its initial query, and then it has to query for uh, potential replacements for low stock items, and all of these involve multiple models. Um, you know, at at one point at Instacart, when we had all of these microservices that were you know Python based. Um, 
our our P90 query times for search were up around eight seconds to get through. And sure, that's P90. It only happens one in 10 times, right? Uh, except people do more than 10 searches on every visit. So basically every customer was hitting at least one of these. And when you make somebody wait, you know, eight, nine, 10 seconds, um, during their shopping cart, so some significant portion will churn out or they'll just give up on whatever it was that they were looking for that time and search for something else. And so if you don't just lose, if you don't completely lose the customer, you'll at least lose some fraction of sales. Um, and so I, re I, I realize this talks not about, not about Instacart, talk about your stuff, but like, was that eight second P P90, was that like a, you flipped a switch on something new and it was just that slow or was, was it oh, slow? Oh, no, no, no. No, machine learning, they always want to add like a little bit more data or a little bit more sophistication or one more microservice. And so it's constantly like each microservice they add to add some new functionality. It's like, oh, this one's only 50 milliseconds, right? Yep. But then when you've got dozens of them involved at the end, you know, after years of iterative development on a search and recommendation system, then yep. all of a sudden the CEO of the company is like, hey, guys, I was trying to search on my mobile and it was just timing out. What's going on with your team? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say the other thing we notice is for some of our, this is Otterton stuff. For some, when the when the CFO or the CEO knows the name of the service or the name of the database, that's a problem. Then, then like you got that's when people you know people got you know actually act, or have a motivation to actually fix it. Yeah, no, it, it's definitely true. And so I I got to be part of a task force that was tasked with like you're going to bring down search performance speeds and you're going to make this system better. Um, and that's actually where, you know, this talk is about um, PostgreSQL, but a lot of the thinking for PostgreSQL came from those explorations and those learnings. I mean, a, a lot of it was my fault, too. Like, you know, when I got to Instacart, um, I, I helped build the machine learning platform and I helped set up a lot of the data engineering principles. And, you know, I, a lot of service oriented architecture makes sense. I don't want to bag on like microservices are a terrible idea. If you can like fully isolate something like I mentioned, then it's actually great and you should you should try to do that. And it's a great way to break load out of your primary database without complicating your life too much. But in in the end, if your business is as successful as something like Instacart is, you you will have database problems. And so in the end, we moved to, to an architecture like the one I've got on the screen now, where we did end up sharding Postgres. Um, and, and we ended up sharding multiple Postgres databases, but we're now, Instacart is fronting all of their Postgres clusters with PGCAT um, so that it makes it much cleaner at the application layer so that they can go through a proxy pooler like this um, that is shard aware and that can handle failure recovery and everything else. And it, and it, it so if, if you know this is where you're going to end up, this is actually the desirable end state for your app where you're not having to cache so much of the application layer, but you can you can actually to remove database load, but you can actually handle scaling your database horizontally, both with replicas and sharding, and that it's actually not that horrendous and terrible of a process. Um, and especially if it will save you from all of the other pain points that can be involved in microservices and having many different kinds of databases out there, then I think this architecture is a pretty sweet spot to live in. But the, the really nice thing about this architecture is that you don't have to start with it. You can actually start with the original web app architecture of like, you've got one app, you've got one database. So like you pick your app server, whether that's Node or Python or Ruby or Java, pick your database. Uh, Postgres is a really good choice um, because it's so general purpose, can handle so many workloads. Um, but just know that it's rather than having to like make your app really complicated, uh, you can just throw a, a pooler in the middle of your databases uh, and you can keep that and you can scale out. And so I think companies that go this way in the future uh, um, will have a much better time. There's something I've seen at a lot of startups is that that I've worked at is when we have all the engineering buttoned up really well and we have our architecture super clean and crisp and everything's properly refactored all of the time, usually the business isn't doing very well. <laughs> And I think that's why you have all of the time to get all of your engineering right. I think that if your business is really growing really quickly, that there are so many urgent priorities for engineers to work on, that there's very little time to go back and clean everything up. Um, and so if you don't have that pressure to, to move quickly, 
then, then maybe your engineering will be okay, uh, but maybe your business won't. And you know, after after sort of coming to that conclusion, I decided, well, I'll just found an engineering specific company. So <laughs> engineering will be the whole business and we can make the engineering really good so that I can have my cake and eat it too. Um, because, you know, as a software engineer, code cleanliness uh, and best practices and strong principles are, are important to me sort of aesthetically. But but in the end, like you, you have to be willing to to do what needs to be done for the business, um, not necessarily for the for whatever idealistic engineering principles I happen to have. Um, so don't. Uh, and in, um, sorry, do you accept questions along the way? I, I joined late. Sorry. Oh yeah. yes. Yes. Okay. So just a question on the sharding. Um, I was wondering. Not sure if you're aware of like systems like CockroachDB or Yugabyte. Would you consider those instead of sharding, or would you prefer sharding over those uh, systems that have the partitioning, so to speak, in their schema built in? No, I, I think that those those can be great. Um, one anecdote I'll share as well is that you know we we moved to Elasticsearch. Um, that was one of our first projects. So we had a Postgres catalog database holding all of our product data, um, and so we that database was overloaded and falling over because we were treating it like a data warehouse, not like a application database. Um, and one of our, the first projects was to move all of that data into Elasticsearch and confront it with a sharded Elasticsearch cluster, uh, which was great for about five years, but we didn't have good enough control over the Elasticsearch sharding schema and algorithm and everything else to get where we needed to be and eventually we had to redo our sharding on Postgres where we could have more control over the end-to-end -end solution. Um, you know, we, we, we escalated all the way up to the CTO of Elastic um, and because of some of our needs, they were like, oh, well, yeah, it says right here in our documentation, you can't, you can't do cross shard joins. Um, those are always going to be slow. Um, and so if you, if you, uh, and we don't have any indexing types that will help get you out of this jam that your business requires you to be in, um, so I, I, long story short, yes, there are lots of um, databases out there that will do the sharding for you. All you have to do is pick a key. Um, great if you can use those. At some point, you may find that your your needs get more complicated and you need and you have these cross cutting concerns. And I think particularly with machine learning, again, you find yourself where you end up in these cross cutting concerns where there's no single sharding key that will do it all for you. Uh, and you and you have to have to reconsider. But yeah, um, I, I one of the things I really like about Postgres is just how how much control ultimately you can have over everything. And if it's not built into Postgres itself, it's it's one of the most exp extensible databases out there. Always write your own extension to do the thing that you want. Um, so that that's actually a lot of where the motivation for Postgres ML came from. Uh, it was it was a realization of if we have this horizontally scalable database um, and all of the all of our machine learning data, like the the scalability of these machine learning microservices, the hardest part was always scaling the feature store. The hardest part of engineering, the most complicated engineering, was about getting the data from wherever it lived into the feature store so that it would be there in time to make the the real time online prediction. Um, and and so trying to figure out, you know. Um, how we simplified those systems. At, at Inscart, we ended up replacing our Elasticsearch cluster with a, a system very similar to what I've shown you, um, that is big Postgres sharded thing. And then we started moving all of our feature store data from various databases into this big sharded cluster. And we did this in the middle of COVID. I don't think that, you know, had the, the business not been exploding, exploding in a very good way, uh, you know, doubling every other week or something, um, then we wouldn't have had the license to start making these huge engineering moves um, and having sort of all hands on deck of pulling everybody's favorite database out of their hands and saying like, this is the one scalable system. Your system is like quickly going down under this load. So so the only option at that point was to build something like, like we've shown. And it, at the end of the day, it was shockingly successful um 
you know, we went from a, a like for example, if you wanted to add some new data to the Instacart catalog and a product manager was like, oh, we want this feature. It would take literally the, the last one we did on Elasticsearch took three quarters of iteration. So nine months. Of, okay. The product manager says they want this feature. They go to the catalog team. The catalog team's like, we're going to put that in Snowflake. Uh, and then we're going to figure out a way to like ETL that through Druid to do some feature computation. And then we're going to go from Druid and just that into Elasticsearch. And then, oh, by the way, we didn't get it in the, the right format that the search team needs it. So we'll just start this whole like development cycle over again and cross like three, three VPs of engineering um, and, and half of a half a dozen engineering teams. The coordination overhead there was terrible. Um, it's like, oh, wait, we don't support your your data type for timestamps. Let's use strings for timestamps throughout the whole system or or whatever. Um, and so when we said everybody was going to put everything inside of Postgres, um, we're going to let anybody can have any table that they want. And then when we had issues, it's like, oh, we're just going to change the column type in Postgres uh, that the two, two engineers can agree in a meeting. Uh, and it takes an hour now instead of multiple weeks of like, oh, we've got to re reconfigure our whatever service. Um, but anyway, I feel, I feel like I've wandered a, a little bit away, <laughs> away from the slide. Um, if you if you don't buy all of the article, um reasoning for simpler database architectures and how those will make your life better, they're in, especially in terms of machine learning complexity, um, there there's this notion of data gravity that like the more data you get into a system, the more data it will also attract, the more applications will get built around it. And again, you'll have this snowballing problem of like unconstrained growth in the data layer. But in machine learning, you, you have a different option. Um, you know, you can be running your, your model as if it were a stateless service. And every time your model needs to make a prediction, you can go fetch data and pull the data up to the model. Um, or you can do what PostgreSQL does, which is push the model down into the database, into the, the data storage layer. And then, you know, you're not pulling data out of the database to the application layer. You're, you're just passing a pointer from Postgres shared buffers through the model. And so there's no more data movement. Um, but this does mean you have to redeploy models. And so you're moving models instead of moving data. And in my mind, this is... This is fundamentally better and it's provably better because any model is always smaller. If it's a good model, it's always smaller than the data set that it's trained on. And it's always going to be smaller than the data set that it will be used for prediction. And it will always change less frequently than the data set that it's being um, you used to model. Otherwise, it's just not a good model. If you have to constantly update your model, then it hasn't generalized uh, and you've you've really failed at the, the machine learning aspect. So if you build your model well, uh, then there, there will be fewer electrons involved in a Postgres ML kind of process than would be in a microservice architecture process. And yeah, there's there's a question of like, how much it does that actually matter? Aren't computers fast? Aren't networks fast? Um, isn't ML inherently slow um, and and expensive anyway? So are you optimizing the right thing? And that's a really good question. You should always you know benchmark and optimize the right right thing. There's another question of like a lot of Postgres ML thinking applies to classical machine learning. Um, you know when the systems that we were building this for, we did have some deep learning models involved in um, our search services uh, at Instacart years ago, running like TensorFlow 0.4 or whatever it was in production. But the, the, new, the new world that everybody's really excited about is like vector databases and GPT-4 and OpenAI. And like, can't you just make a call to OpenAI? Why, why do I need to consider anything else? But if you're even in the new world, your your open AI chat GPT model in the open source world where you're, you're hosting this thing yourself, it's still a massive thing. It's still 70 gigabytes. Um, it, it's quite a bit uh, 
quite it, it will break all of your traditional software application continuous integration deployment pipelines because most people aren't deploying 70 gigabyte kubernetes containers so you're going to have to re rethink your your deployment system as it is and like how you actually manage these systems but at the same time, these models are still incredibly data hungry at inference time because you need to you need to go pull back not just one vector, um, but but potentially hundreds of vectors. You know, people vector databases will do cosine similarity, but cosine similarity is actually a really bad predictor of relevance compared to having a trained model that is trained to predict the relevance. And one of the things that um, is catching on now is like, oh, I'll fit, I'll fetch 10 uh, documents from my vector database by nearest neighbor. And then I'll feed that to a pruning model that will select the top two or three most relevant documents before I actually pass that on to my text generation model. And so even in this new world of LLMs and vector databases, being able to have the data it, it, whether it's vector data or traditional user data, tabular data, um, in the same process as the LLM. So even though LLMs are slow to run, you know they're anywhere from 10 milliseconds to many seconds of runtime, um, that data movement is still a considerable case or a considerable expense. Uh, I've got some benchmarks we can show later in the talk. Um, but this this matters as much as ever that you you really can load up your llama in your database one time, and that's a one time data movement cost that will then save you from moving vector. And keep in mind, vectors are you know a thousand four byte floats long. That's four kilobytes. It doesn't take like, if somebody wants to pull a hundred vectors out of your Postgres database, then they're talking about half a megabyte of data movement. Um, and then you're going to pull that into a Python process, which is going to blow it up to like 50 megabytes of Python data memory. Uh, and then you're going to run it inside your model. And it's just, it actually, you'll, you'll spend as much time in pandas in, in the data frames in the Python world as you will actually using your model and actually using your data. Um, and one of the really cool things is like, you can see that this is a sequence, sequence of events that starts with the app and goes through the embedding model. Uh, and then it goes prompt creation and then it goes tech generation and then the response comes back to the app. Um, I should have had an entry arrow on this diagram starting with the app. Uh, so you can see the actual whole loop, um, what a request lifecycle looks like, but you can actually write a single Postgres query with multiple common table extensions, um, they can do the first multi, you know, it can do a union between a, an embedding query um, and a normal SQL query um, a, as a CTE. And then it can actually have, you know, Postgres string concatenation or other UDFs to actually generate your prompt um, as a second CTE. Uh, it, that can that can then be calling a, a pruning model as a third CTE, and so you can just chain chain these common table expressions together until what you really have is like a full program of, of multiple steps. Except that program, instead of executing across a web of Python microservices, serializing and deserializing the data at every single step, it all happens inside a single Postgres process. And so you, you you cut out so much network latency. And when we actually look at the load on the database in these cases, from serializing all of this data in and out, like Postgres load and query times actually drop because instead of having to send back, you know, half meg of um, vectors on every single query, they're, they're sending back like a 10 kilobyte uh, text string or something. And so just like the data movement in and out of the entire system can drop significantly. And, and, and then you don't, you've also like dropped off this huge web of microservices that are now non-existent instead of eating massive GPU bills. Um, so I, I hope I've convinced you that this is at least an interesting idea. I was going to give you a little bit of an idea of like what, what Postgres ML actually is. Um, and it, for classical machine learning, it's just these three functions. These are basically UDFs inside that the extension provides for Postgres. Uh, machine learning is is actually a very well defined process. It's uh, you know I, I should we have supervised and unsupervised learning. We have classification and regression. 
these are all you know tasks that can be done with machine learning if you're not familiar these can all be provided as just parameters to a training function you can just say i want a classification model uh, literally that's that's the task that's what it's going to do the problem formulation with machine learning is still i think hard and i think that's where where most people get stumped. Like, but once you can formulate your business problem as a machine learning, either classification or regression, um, or, or now as a text generation process, um, problem for chat GPT, then you're off, off to the races. So PostgreSQL gives you the ability to train models. It gives you the ability to then you know, strategically deploy those models like you, like you would expect. And finally, it gives you this predict call that you can now you know, leverage that model given some new data that's been written to the database. Or you can just pass, you know, Postgres accepts parameters in queries. You can just pass the, the you don't even have to actually, this was surprising to us that people were using Postgres ML as just a model inference service, as a, you know, basically stateless service, but it, they liked Postgres better than having like gRPC or some other HTTP REST um, endpoint because they, they trust Postgres to, to be able to serve responses reliably and they know how to manage Postgres as an existing piece of infrastructure. There's, there's I think this is more like the new school of vector databases and um, transformers that Postgres ML also provides. It's worth, I think, noting that, and I'll talk about the technology that we use and how we build this stuff in a little while, but the transformers um, stuff, the hugging face transformer stuff is still in Python. Uh, everything else is written in Rust. And so we have like good zero copy abstractions and a lot of places we can move data without having to actually copy it. Um, but in the Python case, you know, we still do have to go through Python to access some of the latest LLMs. And those things are changing and coming out like every week. So it's pretty hard to nail them down and, and standardize them, but there's progress being made. And I think we'll get back to a, a, a lower level implementation uh, um, on this front in the future. But given those six, six functions, you have a very comprehensive you know, machine learning toolkit that you can solve a lot of problems with, with everything in Postgres. So, this this slide talks a little bit about how we actually um, share memory inside of the Postgres process. If you if you know Postgres very well, then you know shared buffers, um, where Postgres uh, pages data in and out from disk to RAM, and that's that's configurable. But we store our models in Postgres tables, and we store our feature data in Postgres tables. Um, and so that is naturally stored in the shared buffers. Uh, and so Postgres manages that global cache resource for us. But each connection uh, that's opened for Postgres, um, when you actually call one of these functions like predict or embed or transform that leverages a model, that the actual, you know, pulling the model out of the, all of the weights out of shared buffers and instantiating it with whatever model inference library it, it needs to use, whether that's XGBoost or Scikit-Learn or PyTorch, um, you know, we support all of those under the covers. Your model gets cached in the connection. Um, and because so many of these models um, run in Python and were originally conceived of in Python, none of them are developed to be concurrent. Uh, support concurrent access. They all have some kind of a lock around their usage. And so this actually works really well in the Postgres connection process um, memory model because ev because every connection is an independent process, we can load as many copies into as many different connections. And then it's Postgres connections that give you concurrent access to the model um, a, a, as many times as you need. Now, this PGCAT is also really important in this picture because PGCAT allows us to keep that connection open even when a client goes away, which preserves our model cache of what models were actually being used. We can also use Postgres roles. And so like, if you want to isolate certain connections or throttle certain models um, and enforce queuing, you can do all of that with PGCAT. And you can say that you know whatever user is using model XYZ, 
we're going to limit them to one or two or 10 backend Postgres connections, which limits their total usage uh, and throughput in the system and their queue. And that'll leave the rest of your Postgres database available for your application workloads or your other modeling workloads that you might have. Um, GPUs. How, how, okay. how big is usually a model? Um, it, it varies wildly. But a linear regression model is like eight bytes. It's like yeah, two yeah, floats, yeah. basically. And you can actually do a lot like that. Uh, but like an XGBoost model can be anywhere from like 10K to a couple of megabytes. XGBoost okay. really is state of the art for tabular data inference. But like, yeah, it's on a connection for like a state of the art model for doing, you know, most of the search tasks. It's totally fine. It's to even even on like a, a, a tiny database. But when you get into LLMs, then you can be talking about like a, a you know, a Llama 7 dB is like 280 gigabytes if you're using the full precision. Yeah, that, that's what I was getting at. So like, so every connection, every every Postgres worker has this own copy of a model sitting in memory and, and it's not, is it in shared buffers? So, I mean, it because the model is persisted in a table, so if you want Llama 7 DB in Postgres ML and get persisted in a table, yeah. um, it's going to be a 280 gigabyte. Well, you know, there's a row, row data size limit in Postgres. So we transparently split it up into multiple rows and then we stitch them back together. When you load your model, that becomes 280 gigabytes in shared buffers. And then that actually, you know, will get actually copied into your connection specific model cache. So then your connection will have a two, will need 280 gigabytes of work mem. Yeah, that's what I was. That's what I was getting at. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's so much to the point for. I understand not everyone's running the full llama thing, but like, at some point you need to dedupe that memory. Yeah, uh, absolutely, and I think that that will be part of the move away from Python transformers to mm -hmm. libraries like Rust formers. Um, this is all very new stuff for us that we've just been you know extending in the last three to six months, and we've got a lot of work to do on this. But I think you're absolutely right. And, and we want to get to a point where we can like share beyond what people are doing in Python, where we can actually share the read-only weights of these models. And then we'll only need to allocate um, memory for the intermediate computation steps. There's still a lot A lot of these buffers are still intermediate computation that, that have to be isolated and can't be concurrently accessed by multiple processes at the same time. Um, because th they write to them for intermediate use, but we we can definitely do better there. Awesome, thanks. Um, and it, we're you know, the GPU cache is also interesting in that regard because we it, you can you you're much more memory limited on GPUs, and so I think this is where a lot of the motivation for us is coming from deduping memory, and and we're we have a serverless cloud offering right now where that being able to offer people, you know, a time slice of a GPU and a shared memory model across multiple connections is, is really important from, because most, you know, a lot of people experimenting with LLMs and transformers right now are hobbyists or enthusiasts or prosumers. Um, working on hobby projects. They're not necessarily large corporations that have the budget to spend $5,000 a month on a GPU in the cloud. Uh, and so being able to reuse that multiple connections for PGCAT is something that we're pretty excited about. Because then we can you know, charge people 60 or 70 bucks for their little embedding model. They've got a vector database with an embedding model that they can query you know, many times an hour for their chatbot, um, but they can't. They they can't, and they don't need to fully utilize the GPU, either its RAM or its compute. So yeah, I think ex expect to see more there. Um, and so we we love benchmarks at Postgres ML. Um, in some ways, I feel like we're just cheating because we don't have all of the network overhead and everybody else has network overhead. You know, we can say things like we're 10 times faster than OpenAI for embedding generation, um, but that's because you have to call OpenAI up over the internet. That like You can't run OpenAI in your data center. The best you can do is like try to guess where Microsoft is hosting 
their things and then to put your your, your app or your whatever in the same data center. Um, but you, you're still su subject to, to all kinds of queuing and whatever. And a lot of a lot of people think that like, oh, OpenAI is the clear leader. Um, and so like it's worth waiting for higher quality. I want the best um, when it comes to these things, but it's not true. OpenAI has lost pretty much every domain except for text generation. Um, you know, they used to be the leading image producer with Dolly 2. Um, and it's funny I say this because uh, they've just come out with the integrated Dolly in GPT-4, um, try, trying to get back to relevance against Stable Diffusion or against Midjourney, mid which really took it away from them. Um, they, they used to be really relevant when it came to embeddings and they had good embeddings, but they're now ranked like 12th or 13th and they keep getting pushed down the leaderboard board across like the, the metrics that we see. And I mean, this is a whole other interesting co question of like, is open source gonna win or is closed source gonna win? Will, will open AI keep their, their lead and will you always need an open AI integration or will we actually be able to run open source models um, in, in our database or in our local Llama setup? Uh, my money is on open source. Like I, I think that you, you, we've we've had multiple reports of like the whole Google we have no moat thing going on, and like the fact that GPT four appears to just be a mixture of experts of GPT three point five, um, and now GPT three point five is losing to Falcon one eighty B in a lot of a lot of um, contexts. So I think like we might even see them lose text generation. In, in the next three to six months, unless of course they release GPT-5. Like we don't, we don't know, they don't tell us. Um, but I think, I think it's gonna be very competitive and very interesting. And there's still a lot of other reasons to choose open source um, other components that you can mix and match with text generation. Um, it's a similar story. Like if you use Hugging Face for your text generation to host these models, um, and then you use Pinecone as your vector database. I mean, PG Vector added hier hierarchical navigable small worlds, HNSW, as an index type last month. Um, Andrew Kane's been crushing it on that front. Um, but even, even with IVF flat, the let it I'm much faster to index things. So it's still a relevant indexing type for vectors. Um, but even using IVF flat. Uh, for query time, which is slower than HNSW and doesn't scale to its larger collections, um, we're significantly faster because you've eliminated, you know, two internet round trips, which are a lot slower than, you know, the 10 milliseconds it types, takes to do an embedding generation and the sub millisecond it takes to do a vector index lookup, even with IBS lab. Um, so you, you can go down the list uh, and you can dig deeper here, but I, for, in my mind, I think that we have presented a, a pretty strong case for, you know, th this terrifying concept of moving more workload into the database, that it's, it's not just effective, it's also safe and it's also scalable. And if you, if you follow those ac uh, architectural principles, it'll, it'll be a lot better in the long run. Um, Oh yeah, it, it is important to note that like a lot of, I think SQL is awesome. I, I imagine everybody in this databases course also thinks SQL is awesome, but a lot of people only know Python or JavaScript or whatever language. And so we actually have another Rust project where we generate Python bindings and we generate JavaScript bindings um, that encapsulate a lot of these common machine learning application paradigms and give you like three three easy uh, JavaScript functions you can call if you want to index documents and recall them from a vector index from your JavaScript app without having to actually write any SQL or know about an IVF flat index or anything like that. And again, this this means that like people who don't know anything about retrieval or, or anything, I guess, can get the benefits of a much, much faster architecture. <clears throat> So like getting, I think I think we're coming up on time. We've got 10 minutes left. Andy, is that about right? Yes. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly. You know, we use PGRX 
Uh, it is a Rust extension management framework. It is awesome. It, like I love developing. Uh, I, I never thought that I would love developing a Postgres extension, but it, it's a pretty nice life. Um, it, it's all pretty well managed. It's it's like writing any other Rust app at this point. Um, I, I love the the strongly typed Rust application with the strongly typed database schema. Uh, having lived in a, in a world of Ruby and Python and uh, Elasticsearch and Cassandra that are all, you know, all of these things are schema and typeless, uh, they're runtime typed, whatever. Um, it's, ama like, it's amazing to see, like I just add a new enum somewhere and then all of my Rust match statements are broken and then I go fix that. And then the Rust compiler tells me I haven't taken care of a bunch of other things and I'm like, oh, I've got to add this. And like, I don't really have to think through it anymore to add features. There's enough of a framework in the application that if I just break the first thing by adding something to an enum, it pretty much tells me everything I have to fill out. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about, about the pull extension. These are some of the libraries that we use under the covers. There's a lot going on to move more machine learning into Rust in the Rust community. Um, so I think, this, this feels good to me. Uh, but in the meantime, we do call back into Python. And there's a couple of reasons. We want good, strong reference implementations. People have been using Scikit for 20 years. They, they come in to PostgreSML and they're like, I want to see the exact same convergence uh, in statistics that I was getting. And so we need to be able to like at least give them that pass that equivalence test before they can move to, to onto a different implementation or different platform than they're, they're used to. So I'll stop there, um, open it up to any questions that people might have. Awesome, thanks so much. So I, I will applaud on behalf of everyone here. Uh, if you have any questions, and then Christoph, you wanna go first? Yeah, I have a question um, on PG Vector. If I look across different vector databases, then they implement different similarity metrics and different indices. And not a single one has all of them. <laughs> so I was wondering, do you have um, a sense of if PG Vector wants to become, in quotes, a superset of all these combinations so that I maybe avoid having to run two or three databases depending on the vector similarity search or index award? So I think if you're, if you're running less than, say, 10 million vectors in your corpus, it doesn't matter. Um, okay. It's going to be whatever, whatever there is going to be fast enough. Um, and also, and that's for in indexing, whether you're using IBF flat or HMSW, or there's, there's at least six um, that I think are out there right now and fairly popular. Uh, PG vector, had, like IVF flat is the one that's really fast to build the index, but it has slightly worse query performance. HNSW, really slow to build the index, but has much faster. So you, you can pick which of those two extremes you want to live on. It doesn't have all the ones in the middle. Um, but I think from my perspective, that's good enough for like 98% of people. And honestly, anybody who has less than 10,000 vectors doesn't need an index at all. You can you can just run the query and brute force it and it'll come back in 10 milliseconds. It's it's fine. Um, I mean, I guess if you need sub 10 millisecond queries, then sure, put an index on it and then you'll you'll be bound by your in, inside data center query time, which is gonna be a millisecond to get between boxes um, and connect to your Postgres instance. Um, in terms of the operations like cosine similarity versus Manhattan distance, uh, those don't really impact query or indexing speed that much, um, as much as like the index type or network latency would. I wouldn't worry too much about that. What you should worry about is cosine, all of those are very simple arithmetic distance functions between two vectors, but they all treat every single element of the vector as equally important to whatever is being measured. And that's, that's rarely the case. Um, and so what you actually want is you want to train a machine learning model using user feedback data to to actually tell you how similar two vectors are and not rely on cosine uh, distance or cosine similarity um, or the dot product or the Manhattan distance if you if you really want to improve that. And the only way you can do that is if you can take, you know, a thousand of these vectors and then run them through an XGBoost model in the same memory space. 
Otherwise, it's prohibitively expensive to pull a thousand vectors out of your database, feed them to an XGBoost model. But this is what we do at you know any modern search and recommendation system. And then, of course, the CEO complains about how slow your search system is. You can't possibly pull a thousand vectors out. And so there's some negotiation and haggling that takes place of like, what if we just pull 100 out? Or what if we just pull 50 out? Can I get some latency budget back for my next machine learning project? But then when you're only looking at the top 50 instead of the top thousand, like you're, there's there's usually something in the long tail that might have been the product that the user was going to buy that XGBoost would have been able to promote all the way to the top. Um, but cosine distance won't find it. And so, you know, you just lose some percentage. Thanks. I'll just say we invited the PG Vector guy to come give a talk and he declined. Uh, so we have the Neon guys are building PG embedding. Um, and they're, they're, they're giving a talk later in the semester. All right, yeah, it, other it, questions? Go ahead, sorry. Okay. I was going to say, it's exciting to see like multiple implementations take off here. Yes. Uh, any other questions from the audience? All right, so I'll, I'll finish up by saying a question, asking, you know, we, I mentioned the the memory dedupe issue. Um, what, and you guys also did a major sort of refactoring, it sounds like from from Python to, to Postgres ex based extensions. What's another sort of major system task on your horizon for the next you know, one to two years that you guys want to undertake? And if, if you want to go five years out, by all means do it. Um, but what's like, what's a major challenge you think is sort of unsolved that the, the space you're working in? Well, I mean, off, off of the top of my head, um, columnar storage is actually really important for time series calculations. Um, you've, you've, they've got good, so there are good algorithms out there and in time scale has already implemented it from Postgres, but unfortunately their license wouldn't allow us to, offer something like that. So I think um, coming up with an actual open source uh, implementation for columnar storage that we can integrate with some of these time series uh, predictions would be good. We do have a long road to go when it comes to adopting Rust implementations for the latest LLMs and making sure that we can get back to a fully deduped um, memory storage. I think that that is what we'll consider 3.0 for Postgres ML. That'll be a big milestone achievement for us. Um, it, it We've got probably 50 or 100 GitHub issues open right now. So I think an enormous breadth of coverage uh, that when you look at what's possible in, in machine learning, there are so many different algorithms um, or bells or whistles that people want that we are we are effectively competing with the entire Python ecosystem. Like as soon as Yandex releases cat boost, people are like, oh, it's the latest ingredient boosted trees. Can you do cat boost too? And it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll add that. But it's a, it's a never ending uh, fire hydrant. So I think having help on that front would be awesome too.